Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another Big Game Indicating Dogs Q&A. You guys know the deal with these. These are Big Game Indicating Dogs, dog training questions from people who are following the Dead Dog Training Blueprint from the Inner Circle. Uh, if you are watching the video version of these Q&As, you can jump over and listen to the audio version on our podcast, which is a bit easier for some people, listening to just the audio on podcast apps. Uh, that is under the Paul Michaels podcast. Uh, <clears throat> okay, a little bit of housekeeping again here at the start. Um, I rewrote all of these questions. Um, we keep going backwards and forwards and trying to find better ways of doing these Q&As without them dragging out. We used to do them live, but then that was a bit chopped up and all over the place. Um, then I was reading the questions off Facebook. A lot of these questions uh, were very long, and just to be frank, I need to bring this up. A lot of them were very, very poorly written, like terrible grammar, massive long sentences all over the place with no punctuation, and just like words missing. And but all like you, I couldn't even read them properly. Most of them, probably at least half of them, I, we had to like literally go through and break them down and work out what they meant and rewrite them and a lot of them I got from probably three or four hundred words down to about two sentences um, but I think we're going to try doing it this way um, we just write your big long comment and we will rewrite them without changing any of the meaning of what you've asked in the question um, because in the past too, we had some very short questions with not enough detail. So um, I'm going to say fire away. Um, try to make your spelling and writing and grammar as good as you can. Um, <clears throat> and even if it gets really long and you give us tons of details, I'll just trim it down as much as I can for the actual Q&A. Um, and hey, if your spelling or writing isn't that flash, then we'll just sort that out as well. And run with it anyway but um, just wanted to let you guys know people in the inner circle and listeners as well full transparency I've rewritten these to shorten them up um, and get them as can clear and concise as I can for these Q&A's um, but we haven't changed the meaning or anything of any of these questions um, my next note here is lots of details is good and we could trim the questions down we've pretty much covered that um, <clears throat> A couple of these questions, it'll probably come up, um, and there's been a couple of posts in the Inner Circle too, which have got a little bit off track um, recently, and I just want to make a reminder here that, again, just make sure that the blueprint remains the main focus here. 100% um, we make these Q&As for anyone to listen to, they're free on the YouTube and Facebook and on our podcast, and you can learn a lot from these Q&As even if you don't have the blueprint. But for the people that are in the inner circle that do have the blueprint, once you've got in there and you've got the blueprint, uh, make the blueprint itself your main focus and hook into it. Um, pay attention. Watch what I'm doing, how I'm acting, how I'm training and what I'm saying. And you really need to watch it all and pay attention. There's a lot there. Um, and because a few of these questions and a few posts that are popping up, it's just, uh, we've talk, spoken about this before in Q and A's, um, some of the answers to these questions are just, it's in the blueprint or, or, and a couple of the posts that I've seen floating around and some of the comments and things are just, it's getting a little bit off track, um, and, and the, I mean, that's the whole idea of these Q&As in the inner circle and everything, right, is to keep everything on track. Um, and at the end of the day, it's all there in the blueprint. Um, and it is a big video series. It's 15 hours and there's loads and loads of information. So it really needs to be watched thoroughly. And a lot of people watch over and over. And watching ahead helps a lot too. Um, <clears throat> and another thing too here that's come up in this Q&A is um, the fact that listening to the Q&As for people that are in the that have bought the blueprint, that in the inner circle, following the blueprint, 
um, how good it is to jump in and even probably start from the later Q and A's, right? Like because they're slowly getting smoother and smoother as we work it out. Um, but we had one question here. Um, what was the guy's name again? Tom, wasn't it? So Tom had a big long question that he put on the Q and A post, and a couple of people commented that's been in the Q and A's. Um, jump in and listen to that. I think some people even put links up to the time code or to the specific Q and A's, and then Tom commented back again in reply to his own question um, that he'd just spent a week listening to a heap of Q and A's and that it answered all his questions, and he's away. Um, and at the end of the day, everything's in the blueprint. Um, it's all in there. And and people were doing great with it before we had these Q&As and all of that. But the Q&As, I think, are just a really good way to get on track and sort of set the tone and pick up on what it's all about. And sort of, um, it's just a constant refreshing um, and you can do it while you're driving, you can do it while you're working, you don't have to sit down and actually lock in and watch a video. Um, because there's just the same recurring themes popping up over and over of, you, you know, you've basically got to follow it, you've got to be consistent, um, it takes time, um, watch ahead, if you're having small problems with a young pup, remember that it's a, there's, there's all these recurring themes popping up anyway. Um <clears throat> Uh, and that's about it. Um, so I'm going to hook into it now. Um, thank I want to say thanks to all of the new people that have signed up. And uh, yeah, let's get into it. So Lance, hi all. We are having an issue with catching the pup to put back in its kennel after free time in the yard. Normally food or tricking him works. But is this the best way? I don't so food I'm guessing is sort of almost like trying to use a treat or trying to use some food to get him to come to you then put him in the kennel <clears throat> um, I don't know what you mean by tricking by tricking him um, having long line is too risky in the yard by himself so I'm guessing uh, and he's a seven month old male GSP so yeah, I mean, and it's difficult to say because I don't know exactly what your routine is um, and your routine might be really good, but this might be a uh, sort of a specific problem that's popping up for you um, as far as you're doing everything really well and for whatever reason that dog has just clicked on to something or something you've something real small and subtle you've done Um has created this issue even though you're doing everything really well but the main thing that springs to mind here is uh, having an issue with catching the pup to put back in the kennel after free time in the yard I w I'm wondering what your um, recall is like in training and how much free time is he getting and to me, um, something like this starting is usually the balance is a little bit out between maybe that pup's getting a little bit too much free time and things have been a little bit too lax and training hasn't been either not quite enough or it hasn't been quite as good or as structured as it could have been. Something's amiss somewhere um, because it's just, if everything's been done really really well and you're not doing a bunch of stuff that is going to be jeopardizing the good stuff that you're doing we've talked about that a lot before uh, you know you can do all your training really well and kenneling really well but then if either you yourself or someone else in the household is letting the dog out and it's experiencing um, you know it's running around or they're um, doing recall drills with it or playing with it in a way that's you can undo your good work quite easily um sort of like health and fitness you can't untrain you can't out train a bad diet you know it doesn't matter how hard you train if you're eating like absolute crap you, you're not gonna um you're not gonna get anywhere you know uh, so that that's about all i can say on that lance is and i probably need some more details and again feel free to jump back and make a post ask a question send us a message but 
I'm wondering what your overall routine is like. Um, <clears throat> yeah, because because if everything's been done right, you shouldn't have that problem. Um, my big note under this, I've put a couple of notes on a couple of these questions. My big note in capitals is too much free time, not enough training and structure. That would be the the um, most common cause for that. Thomas, hi Paul. So this is rewritten. Um, I have a 24 month old dog that is breaking on deer in the bush. I can't stop it. Should I use an e collar? This was a big long comment, big long question that gave us lots of details, which is good, but it didn't really give us much more details over and above that. That the dog's 24 months old, it's breaking on deer in the bush, so it's running and chasing deer, um, and he can't stop it. And he wants to know if he should use an e collar. Um, this is one I do need more info on. I need more info on this. This is my note. I need more info on this. What training has been done and what mistakes have been made? Because it's 24 months old. Um, quite often I get the question, I've got an older dog that I want to train to be a deer dog. <clears throat> is it too old to be a good deer dog? And... The two main ones that I say is if it's really, really freaking gun shy, that can make it difficult. You can fix it, but that can make it difficult. Or if it's chased the hell out of stuff, again, you can fix it with some dogs and you can sort of deal with it, but it can make it very, very difficult. And sometimes it can be near on impossible to completely eliminate. Um, those are the two big things and if your dog isn't gun shy or hasn't chased the hell out of stuff then it doesn't really matter how old the dog is you can train it and it could be a great deer dog but those are the two main um, cautions there for me uh, and here and also it's actually pretty uncommon for someone to take a dog that particularly train it from a pup and follow the blueprint system properly not make any massive mistakes and end up with the dog that chases like mad and they can't stop it we've we've pretty much i can't think i can't actually think of a case where we've had someone um just say my dog's just breaking on deer and i can't stop it. i can't think of it in a single q a nothing nah um with the blueprint dog, I've definitely seen it and I've had it with um, boot camp dogs and I've had it in the past and I've had it with in one-on-ones. It's quite a common one that someone will come to me with a dog. <clears throat> um, a dog's breaking and chasing deer and I just can't stop it. And often that breaking and chasing, when you are trying to stop it, it rolls, it feeds into things like whining when you see an animal and you're trying to hold it back or whining when you lift the gun. It's all the same connected stuff and it's all either anticipation or actually doing of chasing animals and it, it's often it comes from um, out of control retrieving, but retrieving birds that can, someone can have just a beautiful steady deer dog, everything's fine and they go do one duck shooting or one opening morning where their dog is just auto retrieving. So gun comes up, bang, duck falls out of the sky, and the dog just bolts when when the gun goes off and the duck falls. Um, that can transfer straight over to when a deer runs, the dog runs. Um, or uh, people sending dogs out after wounded deer um, to drag them down. Uh, or even someone that's got a dog that has gone out and run with your mate pig dogs a couple of times or it, it can come from anything chasing rabbits um, chasing birds you might have got the dog when it was if someone's got a dog that was 12 years old a rescue dog and they don't know where it come from but in the past it's chased the hell out of something and particularly if it's chased stuff and actually got there and killed it um, if it, if someone sent it out after a wounded deer and it got to the deer and it grabbed it by the throat and you caught up and um, finished the deer, now that dog has experienced success through that. Um, so one of our tr principles, training with success, and that can work uh, 
for you or against you. That's a, one of our big principles from the blueprint is training a dog to carry out its first few hunts in the way that we want it to carry hunts out forever, which is nice and steady and close with us and working with us as a team. And when we shoot a couple of deer over a dog doing that, then that dog wants to do that and stay close and work with us as a team because that's what gets the result. Uh, keep the dog in nice and slow and approach that deer nice and slow and you, you, you'll have very, very little trouble keeping that dog fairly steady. They might push their range a little bit or be a bit of a handful from time to time. <clears throat> All dogs are. You see me putting the long line on print sometimes. Um, but again, I'm, I'm hammering this out here, but if a dog has chased the hell out of stuff, it can be very hard to wind back in. And, and you're never comp- you can't delete the fact that it happened and that the dog's done it before and it's always there as the dog this intensity is it's getting close and something's about to happen you're about to fire a shot or an animal's about to run um, it's always there so um, that sort of is the big ramble on that to cover that subject over I've, I've talked about a lot of this stuff before um, should you use an e-collar I've said this before I would say no um, you know, we don't use e-collars in the deer dog training blueprint and I don't really recommend anyone does. Um, I've spoken about maybe, maybe, um, for really bad barking in the kennel or barking in the truck or dog box or something. But even then, um, we've had that question come up quite a few times and, and pretty much everyone's managed to sort it out and get on top of it without an e-collar. Um, <clears throat> And I can't remember if I've spoken about this before, but I know multiple people that have tried using an e-collar with an indicating dog to stop the dog chasing deer and have just said it's the worst thing they, they ever tried. <laughs> it was just a stuff up, you know, and it didn't, yeah, and it didn't achieve the desired result anyway. So, yeah, a bit more info on that. I'm wondering what the dog's history, what's happened. All it is is I've got a dog that's breaking on deer. Should I use an e-collar? Um, Bergen. Um, my dog won't walk in front in thick bush. She's okay on tracks. I've only been in the bush five or six times. My note on this is do the training from the blueprint properly and follow the taking steps back principle. Um so in the blueprint, so his dog won't walk in front properly in thick bush. He's okay on tracks, only been in the bush five or six times. <clears throat> There's a lot of things in the blueprint that we just check the box on. Things like um, water, obstacles, um, going in the bush, being in the bush in the wind and the rain, um, teaching the dog we teach the dog to walk in front on a track first and then we also have that whole section of going off track in the bush and we do that in training before we even start hunting um, and a lot of these things are things that most dogs a lot of dogs particularly with a fairly decent handler won't have any problem with and you could just wing it but the problem is is there's lots and lots and lots of those things that seem small and trivial um, but if you don't deal with them properly before you start hunting a lot of dogs are going to have a funny little problem with with at least one of them um, so we just get it all sorted out and we go through it carefully step by step it's super easy um, and we make it easy for the dog and one of them is going off track um, in the bush because the first time you do it doesn't matter how much work you do with a long line your dog walking in front in a paddock or on the side of the road or on parks or wherever you're doing your long line training um the first time you go in the bush it's a completely different environment the dog's just like what the hell's going on here um and you don't want to be in that situation on your first hunt um particularly if you're getting onto a bit of fresh scent or deer sign and the dog's smelling that, but it, it's overwhelmed in the environment. It doesn't know what to do. And then, but you want to get the deer, so then you put the dog in behind and go after the deer. And it's very, very messy. And and small things like that can uh, create massive issues in your dog's development to hunt. Um, and that's why we get all these things sorted 
obstacles, water, bush, gun, fire, scent, wind, rain, going in and out of the truck. There's, there's tons and tons of them. Um, I think there's about 125 steps in the blueprint. Um, that's so by the time your dog gets to hunt, everything's just smooth. It knows how to do absolutely everything and it just smells the deer and goes after it and you follow it and shoot it. Um, <clears throat> and that's in there, taking the dog off track. And, you know, we talk, we talk about, we're working on that for weeks and weeks and we're talking about doing um, more than five. Or, you're saying your dog's only been in the bush five or six times. Um, we do the walking on the track in the bush at least five or six times and then we do the off track at least five or six times too. So really, um, if we're just being frank about it, in the question you're telling us that you haven't followed the blueprint properly. Um, it's only a little thing, but it's it, it's in the blueprint um, on taking your dog off track. And including showing you how to do it and um, all the step by step and leading up to that. And you know, the whole blueprint, most of the blueprint is all about getting your dog set up to walk in front and then slowly guiding it through as it gets older and older to do that through water and obstacles and in the bush and then finally off track in the bush and then finally hunting. Um, so that's it, it's all in the blueprint going off track in the bush for the first time. Um, It'll be there in the, um, it's all in the time codes and titles and everything. Um, <clears throat> so again, my note on this is do the training from the blueprint properly and follow, and, and the other important thing here is follow the taking steps back principle. That's one of our principles in the blueprint is taking steps back. Um, and what that means is take, is if you're working your way through training, and you move from part five to part six or seven to eight or nine to ten and you run into a problem with something um you take a step back in training so in the blueprint first we do a lot of work with i don't think we take the pup into the bush until it's about five or six months old um and that's so we have all our walk in front command and our stop go turn and our pups actually already got quite a bit of confidence and we take it to a nice easy track and we just get it walking in front in the bush um, on a track. And you're saying your dog's good on a track. Um, the taking steps back principle is um, if my dog walks well on the track and then I go to take it off track and I have a problem, I do everything I can to guide it through that and get it walking in front properly. Um, it might that might include going to an easier bit of bush or going to more open bush or doing whatever I can. But the first thing to do as well is um, how good is it on the track? You know, take a step back, work with it on the track for a few more days, go go back to a few more sessions on the track, and then try and pick a really good spot and go off the track again and try to get it there. It's so usually taking a step back. Um, we've got another question later on where someone um well they actually and this is talked about at length in the blueprint as well is get if you're working on one step so let's say your stop go and turn and walking in front with the long line on and then we have other things like the non-communicative stops and non-communicative turns and and all the finer points of range and your dog watching you and all of that if you're still at that stage in, in part seven, eight, nine, um, you need to get that absolutely smooth, everything just perfect before you move on to the next step. And I think it's in nine where we actually, where we take the long line off. Before that long line comes off, everything better be pretty damn good with the long line on before you take the long line off. And we've got a question of a guy saying um, that his dog's not that good off the, with the long line off and that he was actually having problems with the long line still on. Um, and it was him and 
he wasn't getting to the long line in time or something. So it was actually, he could have managed the situation better with the long line still on, get that situation really, really good. And then if you do take a step forward and you have a little problem with the long line off, you've got to go straight back to the long line back on, get iron out all your kinks, get it super smooth and perfect, and then take the long line off. So that's that basically following the blueprint properly, like really paying attention of, and following all of those steps, getting each step really, really good before you move on. And if you have a problem with one step, take a step back. Work on the, in that step, within that step, to do whatever you can there to get it good. But if you're having real problems, it starts to turn, you've got to go back. Because every time we're working on one step, not only are we working on that step, each step, while we're working within it, is preparing the dog for the next step. It's all, we're always doing that. While we're doing one thing, uh, walking with the pup in front, standing on the long line, we're not doing our turns yet, all of that is prepping the dog for what we're going to be doing next with the turns. You know, all the stuff we do in the paddock with obstacles is prepping the dog to take it into the bush on a track. And what we're doing on a track is prepping the dog to take it off the track. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> Tom, is it okay to take the long line off at the end of a training session and let the dog run around? And is it okay to sit out with the dog near the kennel to get it to settle in the kennel? So this is the question, uh, and this is, I shortened that down a lot because uh, Tom gave us heaps of details on that. Um, this is the question that he got a couple of good answers to from other people in the inner circle that have been training and had the blueprint for longer. Um, and Tom went away, listened to a heap of Q&As and come back and said, I've got it all sorted, I'm away basically. Um, but for anyone that is listening to that or has been watching this question, waiting for my answer, is it okay to take the long line off at the end of a training session and let the dog run around? No. Um, really important to separate uh, training and control from freedom. Um, because the whole blueprint, we are training the dog on the long line and, and there's a lot of really key points and a lot of really key things that we do to make sure that everything that we're doing with the long line on trans transfers over to with the long line off. And one of the massive major key things that does that is that we never switch straight, like never in the middle of training, take the long line off and go, way you go. Because if you do that a few times, that's just training the dog that that long line coming off means that you can do what you want. And if you do that in the wrong ways, um, if you do that for, ten, for 10 months of training in the blueprint, you'll get to the end, get to part nine, take the long line off and your dog's just going to take off and do what it wants instead of it transferring over properly. So that's really important. And um, is it okay to sit out with the dog near the kennel to get the dog to settle? So Tom had a young pup. He was living in town. Obviously, you don't want a pup whining and barking in the kennel too much. So... Um, and what did he say? It, it cut it down from like 10 minutes to one or something, eh? Yeah. yeah. Um, and instead, of, if, if Tom put the pup in the kennel and just walked inside, the pup was barking and whining for 10 minutes. So what he was doing was putting the pup in the kennel, walking away from the kennel like 10 or 15 meters or whatever it was, completely ignoring it, sitting down, facing away from the pup. Um, and the pup was... So he's basically sitting out with the pup but facing away and ignoring it. And that was helping the pup to calm down within like a minute and then he'd walk inside. Um, I don't see any major problem with that. Um, it's actually quite a good idea. Um, and it's just, we talk about um, lots of little steps, keeping the, the rungs in the ladder nice and close. That's just smoothing out that transition for your pup. Um, adding one more little step in there to make it easier. That's fine as long as it doesn't become a real crutch and you start doing it too much and then you end up in a situation where um, the pup expects you to stop and sit down for 10 minutes every single time. As long as that doesn't start happening, 
Um, if that does start happening, then you're going to have to rip the Band-Aid off somewhere and do it on a weekend in the middle of the day or whatever um, at an easier time for your neighbours and, and the barking or whining to smooth that out. But um, there's no there's no massive issue with doing that, man. Um, and and good on you for hooking in and list, hooking into those Q&As and working all that stuff out yourself. It's bloody good. Um, Chris, weak eye question. We have a 10 week old heading pup called Pip. She was a, the submissive runt of the litter. Her parents were farm working dogs. Apparently her mum is a submissive plain eyed and her dad is a weaker eye that could be a bit barky. Yes, Pip is barky when hyped. Her grandfather was strong eyed. So I think it was in the last one I did a bit of a talk about plain eyed strong eyed and weak pull and strong pull and uh, I think Chris has got one of those mixed up because he's talking about plain eye the mum is a submissive plain eye and her dad was a weaker eye I don't know what that means because plain eyed is plain you sort of get plain medium or strong and when I was talking about weak weak or strong I was talking about the pull which is how fast a sheepdog will move stock and then that transfers over loosely over to a, a strong eye weak pull dog will a weak pull dog will tend to hang back and sneak more on deer um, which is good so strong one's a plain eye and one's a weaker eye i'm guessing you mean stronger I, i'm not sure exactly what you mean by that um her grandfather was strong eyed what traits can we expect from her and are there any things we should watch out for? It's hard, It's really hard for me to say, man, from that, from the info I've got there. Um, we have a 10-week-old heading pup, you know, and her mum is plain and her, and her grandfather was strong-eyed, strong so she's a bit of a mix. Print is a mix. Um, and... Print's a bit plain. I would prefer Print to have a bit more sneak, to be honest. Um, but you guys have seen me hunting with him, and he does it fine. And I've hunted with Labradors with that have no eye, you know. Um, at the end of the day, um, it more comes down to training. And, um, you know, Print's still a nice dog. He hunts like mad. He's a nice dog to hunt with. He's pretty easy to manage. He's had good training. I haven't made tons of mistakes with them. And he helps me shoot. A heap more deer you know and he's and, and i love having him out on the hill with me um so yeah i wouldn't get too caught up in it um i do recommend uh people that are going for a heading dog to go for that that more of a strong eye weak pull a bit more meek and um quiet dog than the real full-on strong eye sort of a dog that's going to run in and bark and bite the sheep's hocks and stuff like that really get them moving i recommend people get a really nice strong-eyed dog um having said that though you know um we've got people with all sorts of different breeds and prince not super strong-eyed um you can get a bit of a sneak going on at times but he's you know fly is very strong-eyed she was very sneaky and like that um so yeah i wouldn't overthink it man i just i just um I'll just hook in and just get your training right and just go for it, you know. Um, <clears throat> Dan, just started the program with a year-old lab. Is going okay until it sees a cat? Then he has to chase them, which is not good as they are my wife's babies. Also has a very weak recall, only comes when he feels like it. Main question is how do I stop him chasing cats? Well, those things are connected, aren't, aren't they? If you've got a recall that only comes when he feels like it, and how do I stop him chasing a cat? Um, I talk, I've talked about this a lot, and it used to come up a lot back in the day before the blueprint was around and, and before things like Q&As, and um, there was very little information out there for a lot of people, and... Uh, people would come to me or ring me for a one-on-one -on -one or a boot camp or something and hey my dog does this or it does that it chases the cat or it um, breaks on when I, if I try to shoot something it breaks and runs 
And I'm like, well, what's its stop command like? And they're like, oh, no, nah, not that good. And I'm like, what's its recall like? Yeah, no, nah, not that good. It's like, well, what are you going to use to stop the dog <laughs> running or chasing? It's either the stop or a recall. Um, so you, for starters, you can't make the dog, you can't teach a dog to stop chasing stuff without a good stop or a good recall. They're both very similar things. They're both a very similar thing. Um, a dog that won't stop rock solid generally won't recall rock solid either. And if you've got either one of those, um, you could stop it. And um, <clears throat> you know, it's it's if you have really good training and management and kenneling, um, things like this don't tend to turn into much of an issue and that management one's huge so um if a dog has and, and this again this is one of those recurring themes i've talked about this over and over in q and a's um, and we talk about it in the blueprint a lot too um, friend freedom and responsibility that's a um principle that the dog doesn't get freedom or responsibility until it's ready to deal with it and as, the, we, as we train and the dog gets older and it gets more and more control, um, we slowly give it more and more responsibility as it's ready for it. <clears throat> if your Labrador is chasing the cat, the cats, and you can't stop it, then it's not ready for the responsibility to be in the situation where it can chase the cat. That's what it comes down to. Um and that's why good training and good kenneling is so important. Um, if I had, if I've got cats around, my my pup. I mean, in the blueprint, the pup's either with me on the long line, or in a kennel, or under sort of loosely supervised free time in a dog proof area. And for me, that dog proof area would be an area without cats in it until I know that dog won't chase cats. And and that's why all that training and structure and management is so important in those first 12 months of the dog's life because if I'm, if I'm uh, strict and diligent with all that stuff and I don't put my dog in a situation where it could chase the cat in a situation where I can't stop it from chasing the cat, if I don't do that, until that dog's in a point training wise where I can stop it from chasing the cat so I see it eyeing up the cat and it goes to run if it was print I go print and he's just going to stop and then I use my recall and tell him to get him behind he's got a solid heel and we walk away from the cat um, like it, now um, I've been in that situation with my I don't have cats we have cats in the neighborhood and they're always jumping up on the fence and man if a cat hits the ground in my section it better while my dogs are out it better get the hell out of here pretty quick not that they've ever caught one and i don't know what they'd do if they actually i don't think they'd actually do much it'd, they'd just run up to it and sort of bail it up in the corner because um i've been at friends place friends places with cats and turn up let the dog let me go and print out of the truck and they're running around, and they haven't even seen it, but there's a cat just standing in the middle of the driveway, and my mate's dog's running around, and they're all stoked. And um, next thing, one of the dogs sees the cat, and Miko eyes it up, runs up to it, print, sees it, and I just say, print, Miko! And they just know, so I've got that control on them. And because that control is already there in that situation, it, just, it doesn't even get a chance to start. It's a non-issue, you know? Um, but... It's when the dog's put in those situations before it's ready to deal with it and it fails over and over a few times and it becomes a habit, that's when it's something that's really difficult to deal with. Um, as far as dealing with it once it started in your situation, I basically just explained it all. You've got to, you've got to get super controlled and structured. Stop putting the dog in that situation where it's chasing the cats. Um and sort out your recall 
and stop commands and that's all in the blueprint all with that structured long line training in a low distraction environment and just start at the start right at the start and work your way through all of those steps um and you know the the stop drill starts you holding on to the end of the long line and you say sit and you stand on the long line and push the dog's bum down if it gets up you push his bum back down and you just rinse and repeat and rinse and repeat and go through until the dog sits when you say sit and you say come and you pull it in with the long line and if it and you just it's all in there you know i'm just at this point i'm just repeating and repeating stuff over and over um but yeah that that's a big um, ramble on that Uh, Lima, my 10 month old lab started not listing when I tried transitioning off the long line. I also had trouble while training on the long line with the dog not listening and running around and sometimes I couldn't reach the long line in time. My note on this, and I've already talked about this in other answers in this Q&A, is execute training properly and don't move on until everything is solid um so your 10 month old lab started not listening when i tried transitioning off the long line so you got to follow that principle of taking steps back and you're saying i also had trouble while training on the long line with the dog not listening and running around and sometimes i couldn't reach the long line in time I mean, yeah, it's just what I've been saying this whole Q&A. You're not quite there. And you need to slow down and go back and work through those steps properly and get everyone, every step sorted properly before you move on. Um, and that's it, really. There's not much else to say from, other than that. Um, if the dog's not listening and running around and training and you can't reach the long line in the time, then you can't put the long line down. You've got to hold it in your hand the whole time. Um, and again, like what I said right at the start, if, you, if, you're having, if you're doing all the training properly, like if you're really watching the blueprint properly and you're going through all of those basic steps properly and you're taking your time and you're keeping your cool and you're staying calm and relaxed and just rinsing and repeating and not doing anything you're not supposed to do and all that sort of stuff, then there's something else in the dog's routine or your whole setup that is screwing up what you're trying to do in those in those training sessions. Um, so that that would be my tip there is, is go back, get everything solid. I mean, you're saying I also, the dog didn't listen when you transition off the long line. I also had trouble while training with the long line on. Um, you sh you, you've got to get it sorted with the long line on before you take the long line off. And if for whatever reason the dog's running around and not listening and you can't reach the long line, you can't put it down. And you've got to like go back, re-watch some stuff and really watch what I'm doing and get it right. Bryn. <clears throat> Hi, when practicing the sick command with my 12-week pup, every time I put my hand in to push his bum down, he starts jumping up and nipping my arm. How can I make sure he gets the sick command? Do I use disapproval when he goes for the bite? I know he knows the command because if he's really calm and focused, he'll do it, but that's only 10% of the time. Currently on week 4 of part 1, but can't progress forward because of this. It doesn't that doesn't make sense because in part one we don't do any compliance work on the sit. We're just keeping it very light and loose and linking actions to commands. If the pup comes in, we gently push its bum down and say sit, give it a pat, and we stand up and walk away. Uh, so if you're on if you're on week which makes sense with a twelve week old pup, you're on week four of part one but you can't progress forward because how can I make sure he gets, he should, you don't need to make sure he gets the sick command in part one. That's the whole thing of it. Print just picked it up anyway, and a lot of dogs will, but 
if you start going for compliance and then you're getting pissed off thinking why don't you get it and you need to get it and you're pushing this bum back down as soon as you get pissed off you've got to just stay complete deadpan calm in training and with a pup we've talked about this in Q&A's a lot if a pup starts biting you that's why it's, that's very young eh from that 8 to 12 weeks is so young and even from 12 weeks to 16 weeks is still very, very young. And the things we're doing is very, very gentle and basic. And particularly in that first four weeks from 8 to 12 weeks old, even starting with an older dog, the first, if you've got an older dog that you haven't done this sort of training with or it's untrained or it's a rescue dog or it's a pet that you've had that, that hasn't been trained properly and now you want to train it properly, it's still very important that in four weeks isn't a long time to spend just transitioning from either a tiny eight week old pup which is so tiny it's it's it's, iq is so low um to just keep it super chill and calm and positive and you're just trying to link actions with commands there's no compliance work there's no no ah sit back down stay there wait it's we're not doing any of that um and you with the as far as biting goes though if you're trying to and i've talked about this in in q and a's a eh? um <clears throat> a lot um pups biting and jumping up and things um i'm just wondering if i go over it again now nah, because you can probably look it up <clears throat> in time codes and things i've done the whole 10 minute speech on it um actually that's a good point i should have said at the start if you're listening to these q and a's um and you have a question or you or i'm saying we've done this before you can go to biggameindicatingdogs.com type in the search bar um and this one biting pup, puppy biting or just type in biting um and it'll come up and i've i've hammered the whole thing out exactly how to deal with it um when the pup bites, you pull away and then you're trying to pat it while it's calm. Um, if all else fails, it's basically up, a real quick, short, up, command of disapproval and disengage and get up and walk away. And then you're trying to disengage with a calm pup and pat it. And that's what's so important with that pup. That's really what I'm, that's one of the main things I'm trying to um, smooth out in those first four weeks <clears throat> is just being able to be out in an area with my pup with a long line on walking around in a few circles one minute it's five meters away it comes to me i can put my hands on it i can sort of stop with it we move on we stop start pat it all without conflict and everything's just calm and positive um yeah um he's saying I've seen what he looks like when he when we've overtrained. So I'm keeping training sessions short to keep him entertained, and he's otherwise good. And he talks about how he's breaking down his sessions and that. Seems like a pretty basic question, but trawled through the Q and A's with no luck. If it's just the biting thing, it's in there. It's in the Q and A's. If it's how do I get my 12 week old pup sitting compliance perfect before I move on to part two you don't because it's not in part one (laughs) Brian hunting in the UK and can't shoot hinds all year round how do I deal with pulling the dog off deer I don't want to shoot without reducing drive because I might want to shoot hinds later on another time of year Um, that's in the blueprint um, talking about pulling off animals later on um, that's in part 11 or 12 um, where basically I talk about how it's really good to start your dog off in an area and at a time of year when you can basically just shoot almost any deer it takes you to it's really good to be able to do that so in New Zealand we would do that um, <clears throat> personally I do it on public land uh, or 90 eight percent of it has all been on public land i've hunted on private land a few times um i like going public land in the winter when the hinds haven't got 
fawns at foot and I can basically just shoot the first deer my dog takes me to. That's really that's a really, really good way to get your dog started off. Um, once you've shot a few animals over a, over a dog hunting like that, you can pull the dog off and be, and be selective about animals um, without affecting the dog's drive too much. And it can have a bit of an effect, um, but it's honestly not a huge deal. And the more deer you can shoot over the dog before you start pulling it off, the better. Um, but even if I was in a situation where I could set the dog up somewhere, so when I first start hunting, I can shoot its first two or three deer over it, basically the first animal it takes me to, hopefully I can get the situation good and I can shoot it. If you saw me and Print starting off on the blueprint, we Print took me to quite a few deer before I actually managed to shoot it. Um, and then I shot a few and we're away. Um, now I can I pull print off animals all the time. Um, if I'm trying to go up to the slips and print will be winding a deer up the side, but I want to keep going up the creek, I keep going up the creek. Um, it's not a huge deal, particularly early on when you're trying not to reduce drive and you and you you're trying to um, get your dog hunting better and keen. <clears throat> I'm pretty sure this is how we laid it out in the blueprint. Um, it's really good. Say you're walking along a track. Um, and your dog is trying to take you into the bush off track after a w the wind of a deer, it's good to follow it up for 20 metres, and then if you don't want to go that way, you're following it up, you're acknowledging the dog's work, you're acknowledging the dog's wind, um, follow it up, get up into the bush, say, good dog for winding the deer, show me where it is, and then you say, good dog, good dog, and you turn around and walk away. Now, when I do that only a few times, the dog good dog, good boy, becomes the command to turn away. Um, that's what Print does now. Print will jump off the track. He's standing up the bank, winding a deer up the side. I'll stand there, look at him. Might take a few steps towards him. I'm acknowledging it. And if I just say good boy and turn away, he just comes off happy. And he'll often come up to me for a pat because I always pat him in that situation, make it a positive thing. I'll even, if he turns off the track and he's going up the hill, to show to indicate something i'll often particularly early on when i'm really trying to nurture him as much as i can i'll actually walk up to him and i'm giving him a pat he's winding the deer and i'm basically standing there patting him while he's winning the deer i'm saying good boy good boy because the next time he smells a deer even if he half thinking i wonder if we want to go after this one or not he'll jump up and wind it just to get the pat for winding the deer you know and it's things like this why it's so important to keep the relationship and bond with your dog so good right from the start you know with stuff like that last question um with the compliance and the biting and getting the dog to do you know that's very important but <clears throat> um and we talk about all that stuff a lot in the blueprint having the dog face up in front of you with its back to you looking ahead and i'll patting print on the bum all that stuff's very important for all this hunting and relationship and management and drive and everything later on um <clears throat> so that's a heap of stuff on that as far as what brian's talking about here actually the dog's taking you all the way into the animal and you're seeing that it's a hind and then pulling the dog off it's all the same stuff so if my dog takes me into a hind and I'm like, and I'm don't, and it's in the say it's in the summer here in New Zealand. I don't want to shoot hinds in the summer here while they may have hind, uh, fawns at foot. Um, if that happened and the dog took me in and it was a hind, um, I'd basically want to walk up to the dog. Well, hopefully, while the if if the deer is still there, I would walk up to the dog and say, "Good, good boy, good boy," and then I'd say, "Good boy, come on," and walk away. If I walked up and the deer run off, I'd do the exact same thing. It's, it's basically just making it a positive. Um, and it's not a huge deal, you know, like when, when I was doing um, contract goat control work, um, we were often hunting in blocks with lots of deer or lots of pigs and we're hunting goats and we're not allowed to shoot the deer. Um, and quite often I'd be turning fly away from deer 
for a whole 10 day run and then i'd want to go shoot a deer in the climb wise on the weekend and we'd go in and she'd just do it you know it's 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 not a huge deal can be pretty damn important early on particularly in the very first couple of experiences um and there's a lot to that too like getting all your training right going right back to starters q a talking about all that stuff setting the dog up to be comfortable walking in front off track with scent with shooting with obstacles with water and wind and rain and bush and all that stuff so those first couple of hunts go perfectly um, having your winding and tracking and everything sorted <clears throat> and it's huge and amazing the difference between a dog that has all of that stuff set up and its first hunt uh its first few hunts just carry out properly without any stuff ups and hiccups and how fast a dog can start hunting really really well like that versus a few little hiccups and a little bit of being unsure and just winging it the old school just take them hunting how long it can take to get to the same place it's crazy like you're talking within a few hunts and the other way can take years and not even get there you know um <clears throat> george uh hi paul did you give print and fly freedom sessions like you gave miko <clears throat> or is that contradictory to the blueprint also just wondering from a deer dog perspective how much of palmico is relevant cheers um for the freedom session stuff, you can see as far as what I did with print and fly, that's all in part one of the blueprint now. Um, we've got some updates there. I don't know when you've watched part one of the blueprint, but it's, it's pretty much all in there. Um, and yeah, I did give print and fly freedom sessions, but it was very controlled and structured and careful. Um, as far as from a deer dog perspective, how much of Palmico is relevant, um none of it pa uh, the palmico dog guide is our general dog training video series for someone that has just got a dog in town or whatever anywhere and they've got a dog that's just a pet um and they don't know how to train it and they want to have good control have they want it to be good on it basically like what my dogs are like without all the hunting stuff so it's good on the leash they've got control of it it hasn't got separation anxiety. It's happy and confident and all that sort of stuff. That's what the Palmico Dog Guide's about. It's just general dog training series. Um, the big thing that it does have, <clears throat> or a few big things, is at the start we go over um, crating and kenneling inside. Um, so people that want to do that with the deer dog um, can do that with the Palmico Dog Guide. You can blend it there. Um, you can just jump in and look at how we do that, um, how we crate inside, how we house train, um, and also how we transition that to a kennel outside. So in the Palmico Dog Guide, we go over crating inside right from a pup, house training, and, and also outside kennel training, sort of all at the same time. Um, and we end up in the same place as we do in the blueprint, except... Um, our pups being crated inside at night and house trained uh, a, a bit more thoroughly than in the blueprint. Uh, but both both products sort of end up in the same place, if that makes sense, with the deer dog blueprint. Um, the dog can come inside and print prints inside and sleeps inside and stuff now. Um, yeah, I think you get the, you get the picture. Um and there's just a bit more in the Palmico dog guide about um, the lifestyle stuff and um, spending time inside. I raise and train Miko in town, whereas I raise and train Print in the country. Um, having said that, though, in the blueprint, there's a lot of stuff of me taking Print to town and to the beach and different areas like that as well. Um <clears throat> The other thing that's in the Palmico dog guide is a little bit of retrieving stuff. It's super basic. It's basically just showing you how to do retrieving work uh, and keep it constructive and positive instead of it turning into, you know, chasing your dog around the park with the ball. 
um but it's a really good start off for people doing retrieving work with bird dogs you know so um that's it, why we've set that up there. You can get the combo of the blueprint and the Palmico dog guide. As soon as we made the Palmico dog guide, people were asking, what is it? Can I get them together? So we set that up. Um, there's just a heap more. None of the stuff in the Palmico dog guide jeopardizes anything in the blueprint and vice versa. Um, it's just a heap more stuff and more options. Um, Jammin. Jammin. Jarman, Jarman. Hi Paul, I have a 12 week old GSP heading dog. We have been training her with the blueprint for five weeks. We started off doing very well, but now she gets very excited when we try to train. She tries to pounce on my feet or runs around biting the grass or leaves and twigs. I give her the command of disapproval and try to keep her moving and away from too many distractions, but feel like I spend the whole session growling her with no result. I train her for 15 to 20 minutes, two or three times a day. Do I need to let her play more and train less? I'm pretty sure it was this one, or it was a question with the exact same thing about biting and stuff in training sessions. And then a bit of a uh, conversation started up in the, in the comments um, on this question. And Jarman said that someone else was having a problem and was like, hey, did you did you work anything out on this? And he said, um, biggest thing is not getting frustrated and just staying calm and just keep the training sessions. See, this is 12-week-old pup, super young. Um, keep the training sessions super light. We're not doing any compliance work and keep the training session short, like don't get frustrated, and if the pup starts biting leaves and trying to bite your hand, just up, disengage and walk away, just disengage and walk away, and I don't care if it's like, if I let the pup out of the kennel, I walk for 10 meters, stop, the pup just runs up to me, starts attacking my feet, I'm just going to go up, shove it away with my foot and walk, if I stop again and it runs up and attacks my feet, I'll just go up, disengage and walk, I'll just do that for the whole session and then it goes back in the kennel. Somewhere along the way in, in the next two or three sessions, if every time I just stay complete deadpan, calm, I don't get pissed off, I don't react, the pup gets no reaction other than just, uh, it basically bounces off my foot and, and I mean that by just, I just shove it away and walk it's getting no reaction it's no fun sometime in the next two or three sessions i'm looking for the point where the pup's distracted chewing a leaf and i or, or it, 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 gets, it hears a sound in the distance and it pauses for like three seconds and it's looking in the other direction and i want to bend down and pat it and say good pup good pup if it swings around and tries to bite my hand i just go ah disengage and walk away but it's had that little three second experience of standing still, me patting it and saying good pup. It's getting positive engagement with what I want, praise on what I do want, pressure on what I don't want, praise on what I do want. Um, did I say that right? Pressure on what I don't want, praise on what I do want. Um, and it can be that ridiculous sometimes with a pup, especially when they get in that mode and it can be a phase and, and that's how I'm dealing with it. And, and I'm really just trying to disengage, um, basically brush aside and disengage from that biting and crap. Um, and I'm just trying to get these tiny little windows in to get a calm pat. And the, again, I've talked about uh, that reading and timing and the reading, timing and measure of the application and releasing of pressure and praise. I've had massive rants about this i don't know what the, those questions are called um they're in there yeah um yeah that'd be a really good one to dig up um that that's if you get that stuff right with this it's you just completely change 
the way a pup acts like really quickly this used to happen in uh deer dog boot camps when i'd get take other people's dogs in for a few weeks and a dog would just turn up with all these weird behaviors and you couldn't touch it without it um opening its mouth and slobbering on your bloody jersey sleeve and um you'd make it sit but you couldn't step back without it getting up and all of these things and i'd have it all pretty well sorted out and then moving forward within a couple of few days and it's just getting all of that reading and timing right that brush aside disengage engage as soon as the pup or dog's doing the right thing and 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 a huge 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 part of this and this has come up a couple of times in these questions is staying dead calm no reaction if, if i walk out in this sort of tone walk up to the kennel relax hey print good boy come here and he grabs my foot and i go from good boy come here to ah or 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 ah, get out of it and i start engaging no sit down get back er, that can be a reaction to engage that that um commanded disapproval has to be that it's a real brush aside and yeah you're changing your tone there up and then off and you're walking and i'm always trying to get straight back into that tone that i approached the kennel with which was here print good boy get out if he does something wrong ah there's that quick spike and i'm trying to get straight back to good boy patting him again while he's calm and quiet and i want to be in this tone the whole time and if the dog does something wrong there's that ah real quick spike and it's, and then i'm straight back down good boy that it's that really quick switching off and on and reading and timing really important <clears throat> nicholas hey paul picking up a pup soon and my neighbor's dogs barks quite a lot could this cause issues and what should i do about it um it could do and it'd be great if it if your neighbor's dog didn't bark um but living in town where i am now we have dogs barking around us quite a bit we have one straight over the fence that's sometimes like barking and biting the fence at the same time and, and like a combo <laughs> like oh, oh, oh. And, and and i'm out there and, and mika and print barely ever bark at them unless unless it's getting really full on but sometimes they're at the at the fence and i'm just straight away get out of it you know um long story short man yeah it'd be great if it wasn't happening but if you follow all of the principles and training and management everything you'll be fine and just deal with the situation as best you can and it shouldn't really be an issue um and you know the situation i'm in here i've got dogs barking and then they come and go and start and stop and it seems to be i don't know if people i think some of it is when people because we're by the beach here so i think there's a few people come for holidays and stuff so i think sometimes a dog appears that wasn't there and now there's a dog barking two houses over like all day um and i think other times too it's because the person's home the whole time and when they go out and do something the dog's left behind barking all day so it's a combination of the dog either appearing or the owner disappearing <laughs> and that separation anxiety kicking in um but if you do everything right and the beauty of training proper training and management stuff i'm in a situation here where sometimes i've got dogs barking all around me but my dogs are the ones that don't bark uh, they, no, they never bark man um off and on um oh as a pup i can't even remember I'm sure Print barked in his kennel once or twice. He definitely did really early on, but within a week it was all sorted right at the start um, with the sort of rip the band-aid off method of kenneling that's in the blueprint. Um, had very, very few trouble with him barking, but Miko did a couple of times. Um, but again, it was just a transitioning and training thing. The first few times um, leaving her in the kennel and leaving, the neighbor said, oh, you know, your dog was barking and whining a little bit just after you left. But it's smoothed out now it's just sorted um but your neighbor's barking dog is a very good reminder to 
you got to get all that stuff sorted, eh? Um, um, yeah, but the fact that your neighbor's dog's barking doesn't mean that your dog has to. Um, Chanel. It sounds trivial, but I have to ask, issues with recall in high distraction environment, what can you do when you have a solid recall in familiar training areas with little distraction, but that doesn't transfer across to high distraction environments like strong scent? In these environments, the pup won't listen and pulls away, or the pup is turned away from you, interested in other dogs. I'm using the long line. With both issues, haven't moved further in training until sorted. I mean, all of that stuff is covered in massive detail and step by step in the blueprint. Like that's that's all of that getting control and stronger and stronger distraction environments and you know, recall and stop and attentiveness and all of that. It's, it's really sort of, you know, in the blueprint we have the scent stuff and the, the hunting work and the obstacles and confidence and loads of other super hunting related stuff. But really you could say like eight, 70 or 80% of it is all on what you're doing there. And it's this is kind of one of those things that's all in the blueprint. Um, probably the main thing that comes to mind there is if you I'm, I'm wondering how far ahead that you've watched because this is the sort of question we've had in the past when someone's just watched only watched the part they're working on now and they're trying to get something sorted only looking at the part they're working on now when a lot of the keys to what they're trying to do is in is one or two parts ahead um because as far as uh, working on a recall in familiar training areas is good, but it doesn't transfer across to high distraction environments like strong scent. Um, and I mean, you should be fine because you've got the long line on and you should be able to just give you a recall command and use the long line to bring the dog to you um, or turn and walk away. Um, and, you know, later on in the blueprint, um increasing distraction on the stop and things like that and and we keep it all rock solid so on the recall you've literally got the long line there and you give your recall and use the long line to bring the dog to you um so the dog basically has no option and then later on when we uh increasing distraction on the stop we show you how to do things like tie a loop in the long line and use a peg to um, peg the long line to the ground so the dog can't get up and run away while you move away from the dog there's all of these rock solid can't fail steps um, to get it right. So uh, that's the only thing I could think of is maybe you you're working, um, you've you've got some problems cropping up, but you haven't watched the head um, or something like that. Um, maybe look at that. Um, haven't moved further in training until it's sorted. Yeah, so maybe try that. Um, have a good watch ahead. It's, and it's it's so many people, I've said it for a long time, I've said it a lot of times, and so many people that have done it and gone on to do really well with the blueprint say it in the inner circle a lot. It's so good to watch the whole freaking thing. Watch what it's, you can't beat it. Watch the whole thing. So you know where you're going, you know what you're going to be doing. Because so many of these things that you're getting frustrated with in part one or three or six is in part, you know, two or um, four or eight, you know. Um, yeah, and on any of these questions, if I've misinterpreted something wrong or missed the mark, or you've got another bit of info to put in, send us a message, throw it on the inner circle or something like that. We're more than happy to revisit anything, basically. Steve, my dog pisses a lot on walks. I have been trying to stop it by checking in with the long line and using commands of disapproval, but it doesn't work. I think that's one I've trim, trimmed right down. But that's basically what's happening. My dog pisses a lot on walks. I've been trying to stop it by checking in with the long line and using commands of disapproval, but it doesn't work. Um, and me and Vinny had a bit of a yarn about this yesterday, mm. and it sort of brings up some important points or some interesting points. Um, 
I don't. I let my dogs piss, and I know male dogs can piss a lot. Um, print pisses heaps, um, and you know there's there's loads of things that I mean, ninety eight percent of it's in the blueprint. But the longer I do this, and the more we do these Q and As, and so on and so forth, um, I notice little things that I'm like. And I talk about them in these Q and A's. That man, this is quite a big thing that I do with my dog that I've never really talked about much. Um, I don't. I let my dogs piss whenever they want, wherever they want, as long as they're not going out of range or you know running fifty meters over there to piss when I'm working on my dog's range in part seven of the blueprint or something within the reasonable parameters. Um, but and we were talking about it yesterday and like um, if I'm running the dogs on the e-bike and Miko's five metres ahead and she stops to piss, I slam the brakes on. Not, you know, I don't want to slam them on so hard that she's like, whoa, what the hell's going on? But I'll stop as, as fast and as sort of non-fuss and smooth as I can and let her piss. Um, and same with print two. And I do, I've, I do that with all my dogs and any boot camp dog or anything. If they stop to go, straight that's their time. They need a piss. I let them do it and I stop and I don't walk past them because if Miko's running in front of me and she stops to take a piss and I go past her, she's probably not going to finish her piss properly. She's going to be super intense and then she's going to run flat stick to catch up with me and now she's going to be running along thinking I need to finish my piss but Paul's going to just keep riding so I don't want to piss and it, it turns it into a thing and now she's running, she needs a piss next time she gets a chance she's going to stop try again but she's going to want to but she's going to want to be freaking out and, and keep up because I'm going to keep going so I, this is just something I noticed um, way back in the day and especially training a deer dog too I actually want a dog to be comfortable to stop and check things and wind and, 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 and take a piss. But what if the dog, you can do a thing where you're constantly bearing down on a dog, or if they try to do anything, you're like, ah, nah, hurry up, keep going, keep walking. And what I'm trying to do with the deer dog is actually train a dog that is super calm and relaxed, walks very slowly, it knows I'm always watching it, it's always watching me, and we're really working with and for each other the whole time. Um, and I'm actually always pay, right from a it's just a, a right from a pup. It's just part of a relationship thing for me with a dog, is that I'm always watching it. I'm reacting to it, and it's reacting to me. You know, dogs are like a mirror. Um, and on this piss thing, and then we've got this same question um, again further on. Um, exact same thing, and this guy's like, my dog pisses all the time. And, I'm, and I check him with the long line when he does it, and I'm telling him to hurry up, and he keeps walking. All he wants to do is piss, and I'm like, command of disapproval, and he's just pissing all the time, and I'm just, you know, it's like, <laughs> it's kind of bananas to me. Um, and to me, it's a bit of an example of something that uh, it's the tiniest, tr most trivial thing, and it can be the same with, Maybe a super young pup not getting it sit perfect or a, a pup that starts biting or jumping up or doing something. The minute you react to it and start feeding into it and getting pissed off about it, um, it can just get worse and worse. But the the I'm always trying to make everything like as less of an issue as possible and I'm just trying to calmly and as smoothly as possible just uh, cruise my way through and just keep, keep hitting my next markers and just have it as smooth as possible um, and that includes if my dog wants to take a piss I quietly stop let it piss and we walk on and that's it um, so it seems like a bit of a funny one but it's, it's yeah just let your dog piss Hi, Ed. Hi, Paul. My black and white standard poodle arrives in four weeks. 
I have a 13-year-old standard poodle who is awesome, has very strong bond, and will do anything I ask. Any tips on how to treat the two dogs regarding training? I expect the older one will set the tone for the pup, which is what I want. Um, <clears throat> for training, the older dog has nothing to do with the pup um, because you train the pup separately on its own. Um, around the house and in freedom sessions, the older dog can set the tone for the younger pup. Um, and I did that a bit with print and fly where, and, and I'm a believer in this as far as just an older cruisy dog that doesn't dig holes and doesn't chew stuff and that doesn't bark at the neighbor's cat or run around like an idiot. If that's what I used to do with fly, I used to put fly out in the dog proof area with print and she would just sort of lay around and sit in the sun and just chill and print would just, she was sort of his only distraction and they'd just hang out together, and she sort of showed him how to just chill out. Um, so good in that way, um, but people talk about older dogs training the younger dog and stuff like that. In a pig hunting dog or something like that, where they're running out as a pack and ch catching pigs, that sort of thing can work. Um, maybe in a cattle dog or something like that, but as far as training... Um, it's all one-on-one, -on -one, zero distraction environment. Um, in part one of the blueprint, we show you how it introduced fly for the first time and a few different things there. But yeah, it's it's any tips on how to treat the two dogs regarding training? My tip would be um, keep them completely separated and train the pup on its own. Uh, but a chill older dog can be great for a younger pup to hang around with around the house and in freedom sessions and that. <clears throat> uh, Clayton Hi Paul, my dog is about 11 months old going pretty well but has just started whining a lot when training him I wait until he stops then carry on but it becomes a constant behaviour not sure if I growl at him for it or should I ignore it would love your opinion on it um, don't ignore it Pressure on what you don't want, praise on what you do want. That that principle of pressure and praise is one of our most important principles. Reading and timing of pressure and praise. Um, and you're saying, I wait until he stops, then I carry on, but it's becoming a constant behavior. Waiting until he stops sounds like you're trying to ignore it and you wait till he stops, then you carry on, and it's becoming a constant behavior, um, which is pretty typical of trying to ignore something in trying to ignore something negative doing the old only positive dog training where you ignore all the bad stuff and just reward the good stuff um it doesn't work <laughs> um that's why we put pressure on what we don't want praise on what we do want always the minimum amount of pressure required to get the job done um and we're always trying to get the pressure is only there to try and uh break the negative behavior and we're always trying to flip from the negative behavior straight into getting the dog doing what we want it to do so we can praise it there and and if you again if you get all this stuff right these problems just mount away and disappear and things just start running really smoothly you know um, but yeah i'd put pressure on it for sure Dan, hi Paul, I've got a nearly 11 month old male GSP. The last two to three months he started wanting to piss on trees and things while we're walking. I have occasion, I have on occasion let him finish and then move on, but most of the time I'll ignore the behavior and keep walking or give him the go command. This is the same thing. Um, it's the piss thing. Um and my take on it is just let your dog piss. I just went on about that for ages before. Um, <clears throat> so that's it, guys. It's the end of this Q&A. Um, again, thanks to everyone who signed up to the Deer Dog Training Blueprint. Welcome to all the new um, people on board. Uh, if you're watching the video version of this, you can listen to the audio version on the Paul Michaels podcast. Um, if you want to learn more about the Deer Dog Training Blueprint, you can do that at biggameindicatingdogs.com. And if you want to uh, follow us on social media, um, we've got some heaps of videos on YouTube. I've got some hunting ones up there, loads of Q&As. And the Q&As have got 
on YouTube have got, and on our website too, have got all the clickable time codes. Um, we've got 25 odd Q&As up now, something like that. Um, lots and lots of questions and answers and, and biggameindicatingdogs.com has got that really good search function on it where any page, you don't have to go to the Q&A page or anything, just go to biggameindicatingdogs.com, it's got the search bar up the top, search any keyword, biting, barking, pissing, whatever you want, um, and all, and hit enter, hit search, and all of the Q&As with those questions in it will come up, and you can go straight to that question with the clickable time code, you don't have to scroll through or listen to a two-hour podcast to get a 10-minute answer. Um you can also follow me, Paul John Michaels, at Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Um, some of my latest hunting videos with print are on the Paul John Michaels YouTube now. Um, that's about it. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you later.